So hey everyone, this is Michael Lee. I'm founder of the Data Incubator. We're a data science and AI training and placement company. So we're probably best known for our fellowship, which helps PhD and master students look for their first job in the data science industry. The program is completely free for the fellows who get in. And if you're interested, you can uh, apply online at thedataincubator.com. Today, we'll actually be interviewing one of our former fellows, Bartley Richardson, uh, who has now moved his way to NVIDIA, and I'll be introducing him shortly. Uh, but in the me meantime, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about data science in 30 minutes. This is a regular monthly series about data and its role in the world. And past speakers have included Kirk Bourne, Director of Data Science at Booz Allen, Holden Corral, an engineering lead at IBM and a core contributor to Apache Spark, Zubin Garmani, Chief Scientist at Uber, Sam Swift, the VP of Data Science at Betterment, who himself is also a former EDI fellow, as well as many, many others. And if you'd like to learn more about this series, you can uh, go to our website, uh, thedataincubator.com, to learn more. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bartley. Uh, he's also a former TDI fellow, and he's the Senior Data Scientist and Manager of AI Infrastructure at NVIDIA. His primary focus is research and applications of GPU accelerated methods, that is RAPID, uh, and really leading the uh, our ability to solve cybersecurity challenges. Prior to NVIDIA, Bartley was a tech lead and uh, performer on multiple DARPA research projects, and he applied data science and machine learning at scale for large scale cyber uh, security problems. So without further ado, Bartley. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I appreciate the intro. It's always, always nice to be back uh, with the data incubator. I had a, uh, had a great time going through the program, so it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it, and thank you for the kind words. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think uh, you know. Let's talk a little bit about Rapids. Um, you know, really, what we what kind of we do at at Nvidia is, is slightly changing uh, over the years. So people, a lot of people know us from our graphics cards, right? If you're into into video gaming, if you've made a, a PC, you, you might hopefully I don't know maybe have an Nvidia GPU uh, in your uh, in your computer. Um, but really, in the past, it was our our founder and CEO um, Jensen who who looked at you know what's capable with the GPU and this whole idea of the general purpose GPU or GPGPU compute uh, was really started back with the introduction of CUDA. Uh, CUDA essentially lets you program your GPU as just a general purpose compute environment, the same way you would you would write programs uh, in C or C++ on your CPU. It took off really well. Uh, a lot of people have, have been using GPUs for uh, for deep learning applications and other types of such applications for a while, all built on top of CUDA. Um, but when you look at, at data scientists, and certainly as a data scientist myself, uh, my workflow, uh, CUDA really doesn't fit into my current workflow, right? I want rapid uh, exploration. I want rapid uh, results, and I want to be able to jump and not really interrupt my train of thought, right? I want to think at the speed of my data and be able to do these experiments over and over and over again without having to wait for ETL, but also without having to write kind of, in my mind, this is my opinion, right, this nasty C++ code around everything. I want a Python way to do that. And so what, what that really boils down to is rapid. Right, and so Rapids is end-to-end uh, -end accelerated in the GPU data science, all open source. Uh, NVIDIA doesn't own Rapids. We're, we're definitely a major contributor of Rapids, but if you go to rapids.ai or go to our GitHub page, uh, more links later on in, in, the, in the deck, uh, you'll see there's a number of contributors. You know, we have contributors such as uh, Anaconda, Walmart. There's a lot of companies that contribute back to Rapids. And the whole idea with Rapids is, again, get your data onto the GPU, keep it there, don't move it, don't copy it, and really take advantage of the acceleration that you can do there. So if we back up just a little bit, uh, and we'll come back to this in just a second, a little bit about kind of the processing uh, evolution for data. You know, we kind of started out, and, and you've got Hadoop processing, reading from disk, there's a lot of these expensive in terms of time, HDFS reads and writes. 
uh, move forward a little bit to Spark in-memory processing. We see some nice uh, 2500X improvement. Uh, move forward a little bit into traditional GPU processing where you might do a read, uh, write it back out. You might do another read, write it back out, a read, and then finally train. And what we noticed is that a lot of the, the problem was in this data movement and transfer, right? We kept having to move data out of the CPU into the GPU, out of the GPU, back to the CPU. So what happens when you eliminate all of those expensive copy and converts? You end up with rapids, right? A 50 to 100x improvement over traditional GPU processing where you use the same code. In other words, we're following uh, APIs that are familiar to data scientists, uh, the Pandas API, the Scikit-Learn API, um, the NetworkX API, with the idea being that, hey, you, you have a current workflow that's written in Pandas with Scikit-Learn. You can dump that onto the GPU and reuse somewhere between 90 and 95% of your current code base and see acceleration. And just kind of some real, this is uh, actual real world uh, benchmarks if you look at this, I like to put them up front. Um, this is a 200 gigabyte CSV uh, data set, essentially. And so if you look at kind of at the top, uh, you're seeing 20, 30, 50, 100 node uh, CPU clusters uh, running Apache Spark. Uh, and then at the bottom, a DGX2 and then five DGX1s. Uh, it, for those unfamiliar, a DGX2 uh, is one of our um, kind of large uh, supercompute type uh, environments that just sets by your desk. Uh, so it has a bunch of Tesla V100, 32 gig GPU cards in it. So you look end to end, right? Um, 8,762 seconds versus 322 seconds to do the exact same 200 gigabyte uh, workload, right? We can read in 200 gigabytes worth of data in 42 seconds. That's load and data prep. Um, which is really nice for me, right? Because now I get to think at that speed. I don't have to step back and wait for IO to happen. A, a lot of times, you know, may, uh, maybe there's a lot of data science out, scientists out there that are much better at this than I, but I'll get caught in this like large ETL job. I'll step away, grab some coffee, and I will have forgotten what I'm doing by the time I get back. I have to reacclimate myself. I don't have to step away, right? I get to do it right from the beginning. So, like I said before, right, um, and, and I, have some, I have some live demos if we're okay with it. I kind of want to take you through the platform and then we'll uh, I'll fire up a Jupyter notebook and we can show exactly what it looks like. Um, very familiar. The, the APIs are very familiar, especially with people uh, that have used Dask in the past, right? So, if, you've used, if you haven't used Dask, Dask is a way to just uh, kind of parallelize uh, your, uh, your, your pandas and your Python code that you were using previously. Uh, so we actually have Dask uh, that parallelizes our code as well. So this it would be like a traditional workflow would look like on CPU. We switch it over to a GPU rapids enabled workflow. It looks very similar, right? We have QDF, which is our pandas-like uh, kind of API environment, QML, which you can think of like scikit-learn, and, and QGraph, uh, which you can think of like a network X or a graph frame type environment. The nice thing that you get here, though, is because you're already on the GPU, you get immediate access to things like the deep learning libraries, like PyTorch Chainer and MXNet, as well as GPU-enabled visualization techniques. Um, and when I say it's all in memory, uh, what underpins all of Rapids is Apache Arrow. And what we do is, if you do a, a QDF read, meaning you, you take your data, you read it in to GPU memory using QDF or DAPT QDF. Once that data is there, we don't touch it. It doesn't get copied. It doesn't get shuffled around. It stays in that GPU location. And so when you're doing things like QML or QGraph, it's just operating on the same data you already have. When you want to move over, and a lot of times what I want to do is I want to grab a bunch of data in. I want to do some fairly simple kind of quick looks at the data, right? I want to run some statistics on it. I want to get an idea of what that data set has in it. Maybe I want to do some clustering on it. But then uh, I might want to split that off and, do, and go to maybe a deep learning application. I might want to create a tensor and uh, do some deep learning on that same data. You can do that all in the same memory location. So you can go through something like CUDA array interface or DL pack both of which are implemented in Rapids. And so you can pass your, your QDF data frame off to, for example, a PyTorch tensor without having to do any of that copy and convert. 
And same go going back, right? You get a tensor result back, and throw it back over the fence to QDF. I've been talking a lot about QDF, um, and so let's just look at kind of what, uh, what some of it looks like. I really like this chart, right? Because this, uh, this when we when we launched Rapids uh, last October, so Rapids has been around for a little less than a year. We're at version 0.9 right now. Uh, version 0.9 was just released a few few weeks ago. Um, really, what we're doing is we're trying to eliminate uh, all of this waiting on EPL, waiting on workflows, waiting on things to happen. Um, and you see that with a lot of the speed, right? So CPU workflow, uh, power workflow over on the left, uh, GPU power workflow over on the right. Um, the joke is here, right? Yeah, you're going to get a lot of data scientists off coffee uh, because you don't have to go uh, get a coffee waiting for your ETL uh, to finish. And I can show you this when we go into the, the demo. Uh, this is what um, QDF looks like, right? It's very similar to Pandas. Uh, it follows the Pandas API uh, very closely. Uh, you can actually interact with Pandas. You can do a to Pandas or a from Pandas uh, if you want. Um, a lot of the uh, kind of slicing and dicing uh, and string operations are all there and they're all, they're all fairly similar. Again, shooting for that 90 to 95% parity with a Pandas API. So, so don't quote me on that. That's a goal. Um, and just a reminder, we're at 0.9 right now. The nice thing, though, is not only does QDF do all of that, I, I glossed over all of that, that we help, that all of us data scientists use every day, all of those aggregations, all that kind of data wrangling in a data frame. Not only does it do all of that, but it builds uh, these bridges that I was talking about to other parts of the ecosystem. So using DLPAC and CUDA array interface, you can go from Rapids, from QDF, to all of these things back and forth, right? So if you want to, to run some custom CUPI code or if you've got a chainer model that you want to make, uh, it's very fast and very easy to just go back and forth between the two. I want to hit all the major uh, blocks of Rapids, and then we can go right into some code. Um, QML right, is, again, like our scikit-learn uh, type, um, our scikit-learn library. These are just some of the algorithms oh. that we already have, right? Uh, a quick question for you, Bartley. Back on the previous slide, it, does that mean that you're only in GPU memory for PyTorch and QX filter, or do the QDF and QML and QGraph also use GPU memory? Everything is in GPU memory. Uh, from the time, it's actually even more than you might think. From the time you start to read a file, it puts it onto GPU, and even more so, if you have a compressed file, Right, let's say you're working with some kind of like parquet file or something like that. We even do the decompression on the GPU. So it wow. never, never really touches host memory. Yeah, and that's wow. what, cool. that's, a, that's a good point. It's what this kind of like this ugly gray box at the bottom uh, is kind of saying once we, uh, that whole box is GPU memory on the bottom. So you can go all the way from data prep to visualization. And not only is it on GPU memory, it's in the same place in GPU memory. We don't shuffle it around. Um, let's take a DGX2, for example. Uh, you've got uh, half of the cards, uh, sorry, um, all of the cards in the DGX2 are in the link together, meaning that if I'm GPU1, uh, I can access GPU2's memory just like it's my own, right? So when we read things in, we can put them on the memory of any GPU, let any other GPU access it directly. These are all CUDA. Uh, underpinnings that enable this. And, and you don't have to shuffle this data around. Even though you've got 16 GPUs working, I don't have to take data from GPU 1 and move it to GPU 3 and, and do all of this. I can just access it where it is. That's a good point. Yeah, it, it starts on GPU and it stays on GPU. Now, now that being said, there, there's always going to be the need to serialize your data. And so there are ways to get data out, right? We have GPU accelerated. CSV writers, you can write out to something like a Parquet file. You can certainly go to Pandas as well, right, which would take it over to host. Uh, just some of the algorithms that we have inside of QML, um, in addition, support for cross-validation, hyper-parameter uh, tuning, um, but your, your kind of general classification and regression uh, packages, some for statistical inferencing, clustering. I'm going to show DV scan uh, off here in a little bit. Uh, dimensionality reduction, such as UMAP. UMAP is, is super cool uh, in Rapids. Uh, time series, and then some, some recommendation engines. 
this list is growing uh, every release. So if you don't see your favorite algorithm, um, a couple of things. I would, I would definitely encourage you to go to GitHub and, and file an issue. Uh, we, we respond to every GitHub issue that gets filed uh, in, in the um, on Rapids GitHub page. So if you see one that you want, uh, put it in there. If you've got some data that you know you, you would like to try it out on that you can add with it, even better, right? And someone will definitely respond. I threw this in there just to show um, kind of how easy it is. Uh, again, this is just kind of some simple moons uh, data. Uh, and, and this is the kind of scikit-learn, right, DB scan. And I'm going to switch the slide. That, the red is the difference, right? The red is what I changed. Um, and so I, I just changed instead of import, you know, pandas, I imported QDF. I had a QML call instead of a scikit-learn. And here's some, uh, here's some benchmarks. Right, so what you're seeing is the GPU speed up over a CPU, so 120x, 69x, those types of things. Right, so speed up over a GPU. Um, the the colors are just uh, rows, right? So one million rows, two million rows, four million rows. Um, and then the left is, uh, um, oh sorry, the, the, yeah, the left is speed up with one V100 and uh, versus two 24 CPUs. Right. So, um, sorry, the, the, the speed up is one Tesla V100 versus two 20 core CPU clusters. Again, I only made three changes, which is kind of cool. Um, a lot of us, especially when we talk cybersecurity applications, uh, graph modeling is, is very important. And, and I've kind of, kind of glossed over the cyber applications now, but but to kind of start to hint at those, we, I really view cyber in 2020 and beyond as a data science problem. Uh, cyber data sets are growing in terms of size, in terms of complexity, in terms of heterogeneity. The average SOC, so the average security operations center, has between five and 12 different independent software vendors that give them data in their SOC right now. None of them are really, if, if they're by the same company, maybe they're integrated, sometimes they're not. If they're not by the same company, they're not necessarily integrated with each other. You dump all your data into a SIM and then you try to make sense of it. So it's a very large data problem, right? We can see data, data being dumped on the order of petabytes per week. Um, and on top of that, you don't even really know the hygiene of this data. So even just getting a handle on the data and doing that traditional data wrangling becomes very, very difficult. Uh, you really need speed in order to do that. Um, and so another thing that we like to do in cyber is we like to visualize our, our data, at least conceptualize it as a graph. And so in Rapids, that makes it really easy uh, with something that we call KuGraph. Um, seamless integration, again, with QDF and QML. The nice thing about KuGraph is it's not a graph database and it's not a different way of thinking about the graph. It's essentially a wrapper for a QDF that just interprets it as a graph, right? So if you have a data frame, you can make that into an edge list, you have a graph. Um, there's a ton of, of, uh, of um, graph analytics that are baked into that. We don't, have, we don't necessarily have time to go over every one of them, uh, but I'll show you a few of them. Right, um, we're working on a query language, if that's interest to you. Uh, Multi-GPU and multi-node, multi-GPU are coming as well. The things that's just community uh, algorithms like uh, spectral clustering and Louvain. Um, page rank, personalized page rank, right, which we're actually able to go in and uh, pre-weight uh, the transport probabilities. Uh, Jacquard, weighted go card, SSSP, BFS, um, they're all- And you're talking about- Oh, sorry there. Uh, you're talking about multi-GPU. Does that mean that currently Rapids is mostly for single GPU? It depends. Um, and I believe, uh, let me see. Um, I don't think I put it in here. But there is on the, on the Rapids AI and the GitHub page, uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a hit or miss. Uh, if you're doing things in QDF, you can do multi-GPU right now. There are some algorithms in KuGraph, such as PageRank, personalized PageRank, I believe Jacquard, that are already multi-GPU as well. Um, what happened was to get coverage of as many uh, analytic techniques as possible, we did many of them as single GPU, and now we're building out multi-GPU and multi-node multi-GPU. 
And the nice thing about that is it's starting to pick up traction. So as we get more and more contributors to Rapids, we're able to like open that aperture up uh, even more because we have more and more contributors actually contributing multi-node and multi-GPU versions of the analytics. Got it. Um, again, KuGraph as of point eight, it's, it's just a, a slight repeat. Um, this is Louvain, uh, a single run of Louvain, KuGraph versus NetworkX. That, that, um, that graph is performance speed up of KuGraph versus NetworkX. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the data sets being used, so, such as the, you know, the AS Skitter, uh, that's 1.6 million nodes and 22 million edges. Um, and we have around a little less than 11,000 X speed up over NetworkX. Meaning you can run Louvain around 11,000 times faster. This is PageRank, um, just an idea for, for PageRank. Um, on the left, a single and dual GPU on commodity workstation. That just means you've got a box either with one GPU, uh, one V100 or two V100s running under your desk. Um, vertices, you know, if you look at the bottom, uh, you know, 67 million vertices over what, a trillion edges. Uh, using dual GPU, we can run page rank on that graph in 1.8 seconds. <laughs> this is really great for us in cyber because what we do a lot of times is we want to look at how graphs change over time. And so having analytics that you can now feasibly run in near real time, right? I, I, can, I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait minutes. I don't have to wait hours. I can run page rank on a trillion edges in 1.8 seconds, right? Um, then I, I, the, the options kind of expand. Uh, if you're talking about uh, multi, and this is where I'm talking about like, you know, multi GPU versus single GPU, page rank is single GPU, and but page rank is also multi GPU over here. These are 16 of those uh, Tesla V100s I was talking about, um, eight and a half trillion edges in 1.4 seconds. Um, cool. Just a little bit about the community, and then we can switch over and look at some look at some code. Uh, like I mentioned before, there's a number of different uh, contributors. It's not just us. There are some of them. Uh, people are already adopting Rapids, uh, and it's open source, right? So we're very interested in keeping it open source. Very interested in continuing to contribute back to the open source uh, community as well. We've made numerous uh, contributions to things like XGBoost and Dask already, and Apache Arrow. There's a lot of t uh, people that are building on top of Rapids. Uh, Nucleo, Blazing SQL, Streams uh, are just a few of them. Uh, I want to hit on Blazing SQL uh, for just a second. Uh, what Blazing SQL is going to let you do, uh, and they just open sourced not too long ago, so you can go to blazingsql.com and get them. They let you essentially uh, write a SQL query, looks just like regular SQL, uh, and you can read data into a CUDA data frame, into a CUDA. Uh, and it's really nice. Uh, you can read, you can read, you know, a terabyte or so of data um, in, I don't know, less than a second. Uh, it doesn't take very long. Uh, you can do your aggregations all inside of that SQL, uh, and they've implemented full predicate pushdown inside of that and, and everything, oh. right? So it really opti yeah, it optimizes the SQL engine. Um, right now, they have it as a uh, as a container, as a Docker container that you can grab. Um, I believe Conda install of Blazing SQL should be coming very, very shortly. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Rapids uh, is kind of deployed everywhere now. You can get it in Azure, you can get it in Google Cloud, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, Kubeflow. Um, I do want to mention Google, uh, speci specifically um, Google Collab. Uh, you can actually now fire up a Google Collab notebook for free and get a free T4. Uh, GPU in that. Uh, so that gives you 16 uh, gigs of GPU memory that you can kind of play around with Rapids. If you go to the rapids.ai site, we have full instructions on, on how to do that uh, and uh, how to get that set up in uh, Google Collab for free. So if you're interested in testing out Rapids, we get this a lot. I want to test out Rapids. I don't have a GPU or I don't have a GPU that supports it. You can do it in Google Collab for free. No credits, just free. So just a few cybersecurity applications. Um, actually, you know what, Michael, if you don't mind, I kind of want to, let me switch over to the code. Yeah, let's do it. 
Um, I kind of want to bring this up just because uh, I, I mentioned it, right? Um, I just brought up a few notebooks, um, and, and now's, now's the make or break moment, right? Like these work, notebooks have worked flawlessly. Uh, and now, <laughs> now that we are on this call, um, I cannot vouch for what they're going to do. Um, but I, I don't want to go through all of them because there is some benchmarking in it, and some of the scikit learn calls are very long uh, inside of it. Yeah. But I do want to just come down here where we're doing uh, a DV scan uh, with Rapids, right? So it's, it's pretty much the same thing. We're importing pandas here, but really uh, we're importing pandas just to get the data frame. Uh, we're making this kind of just data set, uh, putting it over into QDF. And when you do this call, right, this is a little different than reading it from disk. Uh, doing this from pandas call actually moves it over to the GPU in this instance. Um, and then we can do you know, the DB scan and then we can visualize it, right? It's got to go back out to the uh, to the CPU right now for this particular visualization. So it's going to take it. Um, it's going to take it just a second. But then if we come down, I, I pre-ran this just in case it doesn't work. See, look at this. It worked fine. It always happens. Always happens. Um, it's okay. It's just the visualization. Don't worry about it. Um, this is the this is the GPU version, right? We're doing um, I think we're just doing 10,000 rows, right? So just 10,000 rows here. Uh, I just read it in, and we can time it. Um, 287. Uh, I did this CPU one earlier, right? Um, and it was around 27.7 seconds. All right. So the nice mm -hmm. thing this lets me do is I can just run through a notebook. Right, like one cell after the other, I don't get stuck on you know waiting for uh, a place to um, stop. I, I did want to show UMAP though, because we have UMAP. Uh, it's in QML. But you're going to see a lot of our notebooks. Uh, I will tell you that every notebook that I'm going through is available on the Rapids GitHub site, so you can go through any of these notebooks. Um, we, we we like to put out a lot of notebooks. Uh, we like people to contribute notebooks. So you or anybody that, that's listening, if you've got a really cool application, like we would love to see one, a pull request for that notebook we put in our repo. And then two, um, we love guest blogs, right? So cool applications, we love guest blogs, we love pull requests. Um, just, some, just some training functions. We're gonna load, uh, we're gonna load this kind of uh, in this fashion data set, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, right? Uh, a Nike sneaker. Yep, uh, we just read it in. It took uh, around 3.96 seconds. Uh, I'm not going to run this stuff because I'm going to have to redo it right below it. Uh, but we're going to do this. We're going to do the um, UMAP. It does take it more than just a second. Uh, and then when we're done, we can we can visualize it. Okay, so it's done. And we can visualize it. Maybe this visualization will actually work. Yeah, there we go. So it went through, right, like how, let's see. What is it? It's 24. I guess I didn't import this. Uh, anyway, I was just going to do the timing. It's fine. So it's a few seconds. It's a few seconds, yeah. Just let it do its thing. I think it's around seven. Yeah, a little under seven. If I count, if I count it, I'm super accurate when I count seconds. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, mu it's much faster, right? Um, I, I do have another, I have a cybersecurity application uh, real quick, but I'm going to switch back to the slides to show what we're doing with cyber. I promise to talk about cyber. Uh, idea, so one thing I noticed back there that you were sometimes loading data into pandas and then loading it into uh, QDF. And sometimes yep. I think you were able to load it directly. Uh, yep. Was there just, was that just for demonstration purposes? Is there an advantage to sometimes loading it into pandas? Just for demonstration purposes. It could, it could be a number of different things. Um, you know, with the MNIST, we can load directly in just because it's coming from on file. Um, a lot of these that you're going to see, um, like, for example, this DB scan notebook, uh, to be honest, might be a little bit dated. So as we um, expand the capabilities of QDF, this could potentially have come from a version of QDF that didn't necessarily have support for everything we needed to generate this data set. So we would just generate it in pandas and then read it in uh, so that we could just get data in quickly. 
You could always substitute this in with a read CSV or a read parquet. There's an ORC connector as well, so you could connect directly to your Hive table uh, if you have something like that already as well. There's, there's no, no real difference. Um, it'll be, it's slower to do it in Pandas and then convert over to QDF. It'll be faster to read directly uh, from disk, either it's CSV or Parquet or something like that. But no, no, real, no real difference. This, this demo, these demos sometimes go well and they sometimes go, go poorly, but I, I think what, what we really want people to take away from it is that it doesn't really look any different than the code you're already writing. Right, um, you're already doing, you know, you're already doing DB scan. Uh, you can do QML DB scan. It takes the same types of parameters uh, as your regular DB scan does. Um, so you can you can make those changes uh, and get significant uh, savings in terms of time. So cyber uh, is is an area that is tricky. Um, we we don't have, we don't have nearly enough time to talk about cyber. It means everything to everybody and nobody to everybody at the same time, right? But what Rapids really lets us do is now we can, in a word, we can blow open the aperture, right? We can take the amount of data that was being left on the floor previously in a SOC environment, and we can use that data. So previously, what you would have to do is you would throw all your data into a SEM. And then you would down select that data because you just don't have the tools necessary to deal. I, I didn't have the tools necessary to run page rank over, you know, 6.5 trillion edges every hour, right? And still have other things to do. Now you can. So I want to walk through just a couple applications where we're using end-to-end -end GPU processing, specifically Rapids. Um, one of them is network mapping. So the idea being that I, I collect all these logs around from my network. They're all passively being collected. They're all being generated somehow. They come from heterogeneous sensors. Uh, on the left, I might have Win Events, Microsoft Active Directory. I might have other, a lot of others. I, I should be able to know what my network looks like from that data. I shouldn't have to, you know, buy fancy appliances to do that. I already have the logs. Can I just use those logs to tell me what's on my network already? Furthermore, I should be able to use that those logs to tell me what are the assets on my network doing? What are their capabilities? Who's using these assets? Who's the admin of these particular boxes? Right? And you can, do, you can do these types of things, right? So we can, uh, in this scenario, we actually hooked up to Splunk. And so we went through, uh, from Splunk through uh, Parquet using Blazing SQL. And then once you're in the, the green box, you're all on GPU. So we do not just the data ingest, the graph embedding, the analytics, but we can do the viz. Uh, as well on the GPU using something called Graphistry. Uh, we, are, we apply a number of different analytics. Some is page rank. We've actually switched to personalized page rank. Uh, we do some community detection. Um, the nice thing about uh, keeping it on the GPU is I can do things like graph convolutional networks uh, and do that in the same memory footprint uh, as I would uh, my regular uh, data science. You end up with kind of, I just took screenshots. Um, I, I've learned over the years that Viz never works when you want it to work. Uh, so these are the screenshots of the Viz. <laughs> um, and what you're essentially identifying is clusters of machines. These machines have been identified as doing, uh, serving login services. These are SSDP services. These are your NetBIOS DGM services. You can filter to keep only high page rank values, right? Um, and these graphs have been filtered a little bit uh, already. They're only doing 268,000 edges. Uh, but the nice thing is you can interact with these graphs in real time, right? So you can pull up histograms, you can filter, you can time scrub, all of it in real time. Another one that we've worked on is credential misuse. Uh, so you have a successful login, but how do you know that that login is from the person who should be doing the login, right? I log in as Michael, I have his password, I may, I may even have his two-factor, right? I sim hacked his phone somehow, you know, this whole, you can do this whole Rube Goldberg of how I've gotten my credentials. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I've got them somehow. How can I figure out, are they, uh, are they actually being used? So we take a lot of different uh, types of logs. I, I will mention out here, we actually have another data scientist working at NVIDIA who, who also went through the, the data incubator program. Um, she's on my team. She actually did a lot of this work. Uh, so she takes a lot of different types of logs, makes, makes some features. In this case, we're lucky to have some labeled data. We construct an XGBoost algorithm on it, and then we can flag uh, future malicious events. It looks something like this, right? Essentially what you're looking at is computers interacting uh, with users, uh, or in other words, users interacting with assets. 
Uh, and so you see kind of the person icon, that's an account. Uh, they, all the kind of names have been sanitized and the computer names have been sanitized. Um, and so you kind of see the redness. The red and blue is it's a score from uh, red being one, blue being zero, to how likely this connection was uh, an event of credential misuse. Uh, mm -hmm. Because red is always bad, uh, you can see things like this, right, where this, this particular user at this time, there's a time kind of slider here at the bottom, reaches out to uh, all these computers at another time in the future, a second user reaches out to some of the computers as well. Uh, so we can do this very fast, right? This, this whole this whole workflow from beginning to end takes takes you know I don't know, including this probably takes like ten seconds uh, on a couple hundred gigabytes uh, of data. The nice other thing that we're working uh, with in cybersecurity is we're building out a whole suite of cyber specific primitives. Right, so if you're a data scientist working in the area of cybersecurity, there are certain capabilities that you're going to want. This is just an example uh, of IPv4 capabilities. So IPv4 built into QDF. So you can do things like an is in query. I have this IP, I want to know is it in this subnet block, right? I don't just want to do that for one IP, I want to do it for a whole series, right? Um, this is the speed up, uh, sorry, this is not the speed up, this is the time on uh, CPU and then the time on GPU. So 6.44 seconds versus 1,000 uh, seconds. Uh, we have this for IPv4. Uh, we're working on some for hexadecimal, including MAC addressing in IPv6. And we just submitted a new PR, uh, hasn't been pushed through yet for DNS. So mm -hmm. level domain, second level domain extraction, those types of things. I don't know how we're doing on time, Michael. I still have a little bit of time left. So maybe jump to the demo. Uh, yeah, let me jump over to the uh, cyber one. Here it is. This is one, uh, and again, it's all, all online. You can go and uh, go and play with it. Uh, we presented it at KDD uh, just this past uh, just this past August, actually, uh, last month. Um, so what this is essentially is we're we're loading a bunch of data in, uh, and we're doing this idea of personalized page rank, right? So we we have data that we we have. Um, let me back up a little bit. This is on NetFlow data. So computers talking to other computers, we record some statistics about the computers, right? Um, number of bytes, forward packets, backward packets, those types of things, as well as some kind of calculated statistics as well. We've got some labels in this data, and so we can tell is this flow a, uh, an attack flow or is it not an attack flow, right? And what we want to do is kind of try to dispel two things. One, there's this idea of in cyber, like you never know anything, like all of your data is unlabeled. And it's actually not 100% true. A lot of times, if you're actually talking operational cyber, when you go and look at something, when, you, when your analyst is looking at something, they're not looking at it just because. They're looking at it because an alert fired. They're looking at it because someone reported something weird happening with their machine, right? So all of that to say, you have some baseline knowledge. You might know an attack happened, and you might know these five IPs over here were involved in that attack. The question you don't know the answer to is what is what, what's everything else that was compromised, right? I know about these five. What are the ones that I don't know about? They didn't alert. No one called me, whatever, something like that. So this is an idea. You can actually use personalized page rank to accomplish a little bit of that, right? Uh, I'll have to kind of go through this, this demo a little bit quickly. Um, but the idea is uh, you can pre-weight your initial transport probabilities in page rank and bias them towards, towards the known bad behavior that you are aware of, right? So I can essentially, in other words, tell PageRank, hey, don't kind of rank your, these nodes like you normally would in PageRank when you're assuming a uniform transport probability. I want to bias you towards this type of behavior, right? So I want this type of behavior to certain, suddenly become more important on the network. So, and does uh, that mean... Uh, biasing uh, towards certain destinations, certain nodes? It's biasing it towards actual behavior activity, right? So what, what we're doing is we're constructing a graph, and on that graph we have features, right? So like bytes and all those kinds of, those kind of features. So we're biasing it towards, hey, we have these nodes interacting with other nodes using these features, bias it towards that type of activity. Um, this is just, I, I'm going to skip all of this. This was just showing how you can do summary statistics. This is 100% in rapids, right? All the way in rapids. 
Uh, you can do visualization. This is just visiting out the top destination ports. 53, obviously, is a very common one. DNS. Um, this is uh, looking at, this is just the cumulative frequency histogram, the all data science stuff that you would normally do. Here, uh, we're actually showing uh, the, actually, you know what, here. We'll just do this. Dangerous. Um, this is gonna, this is gonna, oh, no, this is good. It's actually gonna take a little bit of time to do this compute um, just because of the size of this data, this data set. Um, while it's doing its compute, let me go down here. Uh, we've got a network representation of the data. It's really nice. Um, all, you, all you essentially have to do uh, is you just call QGraph renumber. We support renumbering inside of QGraph now and just give it your source and your destination uh, nodes, and it can do all that renumbering for you. The, the really great thing about our kind of uh, ITV4 primitives, let me go back up, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place here, is that we can do that directly inside of QDF. So uh, it was all the way back up at the top. It's right here. Uh, I can take an IP address, like an IPv4 address, and I can convert it to an integer, uh, to a long representation. Um, it's just easier to work with it. But this is all done on the GPU, right? So this IP2N is one of our IPv4 primitives that you can use. Oh, there we go. It only took 55.7 seconds. The rest of it should be a lot faster. Uh, and again, went through this data frame. Uh, here's the, let's go, let's see the shape. So in this one I have, uh, what is that? 800, no, 8,217,202 rows of row, so net flow. Wow. So it's it's a and, it's a nice amount of net flow, right? And and just to be clear, uh, you don't just dealing with numbers and floating point numbers. You can actually deal with strings and manipulate the strings uh, from GPU memory. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking at like this, that's just a string. This was just a string. This timestamp is actually a string. It was read in as a string. Um, so yes, and actually very. Uh, it used to be a separate library, but now a QStrings is now merged and part of QDF, so you can do it all natively inside of a QDF. Yep, it's all strings. Uh, and just in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go, go to the bottom here. Uh, essentially, what, we, what we've done here is we've, we, we know that these are uh, the victims that we're gonna set for training, and these are all the ones we know about, right? And so that's essentially what we're doing. We're just filtering the data uh, right here. Michael, I don't know if you're still there. Your video went away, but I think you're still there. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, we're filtering the data uh, right here just to get our labeled data set. That's just, that's what the training data will look like. Um, and then we're essentially creating our personalization vectors uh, for personalized page rank. And then here's, here's the magic. There's page rank. Um, the only thing that separates a regular page rate call from a personalized page rate call is you just pass it this extra per personalization parameter. So you're just biasing it towards these nodes which exhibit a certain behavior. Um, this, I, I just ran this, uh, it takes around 254 milliseconds. Um, and then you'll get out some, uh, some nodes, right? I want to go down all here to the bottom. Uh, the nice thing about this is, is some of these nodes, right, if you look at these destination IPs, so this column right here, some of these uh, destina destination IPs, like the .10, uh, the .17, the .29, the .30, they were all in our training set, uh, but the .6 and the .8 weren't, right? Uh, and so what we're able to do is we're able to essentially force PageRank to give these nodes that were also involved in this attack a similar PageRank score uh, to the nodes that we use for training. Hmm. That's essentially what we did. Um, I, I, uh, let, me, let me do one thing here. I can see uh, I'm very, if you have a question, I'm happy to answer the question. I'm just gonna run the rest of this notebook. I just wanted to make sure I got to it before we ran out of time. Uh, yes, so a slightly nerdy question here. Uh, so for laying out flowing point numbers or, in, or fixed point integers, Seems like that's fairly straightforward in memory because you just allocate your four bytes or whatever chunks right. in a huge array. Uh, does that break when you're dealing with strings? Strings are the worst GPU thing. memory. Strings are the worst things ever. 
Right. Um, I, I did just want to point out, I finished executing the whole notebook, right? So I'm going to go ahead and bring up this visualization. Uh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done all of that. That's, that's going to, that's going to break. Um, it might not. Uh, yes. So, so strings, strings require a lot of finesse. Um, there, there's a lot of down and dirty and details about how we got, how our strings team got strings to work on the GPU. Um, it's messy. Uh, there's, without getting into too much of the details, um, essentially QDF is built on a columnar representation, right? And so you not only have the columns that represent your values, but you have valid bitmaps columns as well, right? And so kind of QDF takes on both of these things. To get Ku strings to work, essentially what it is, is it's a memory location inside of a memory location, right? So rather than kind of keeping all of that together, it's like a, a pointer outside from that QDF series that then wraps a, an object. We call everything an object, which can be a string. Okay, okay. Um, so, so you do have to sort of do, do that kind of operation because it seems like that then makes the parallelization a little harder, right? It does, and that was, that's kind of the trick, right? So it was, it's actually part of the development work is creating the Pythonic APIs, and then part of the development work is actually creating the lower level CUDA primitives that even enable all of the parallelization, right? It's just, it's just like, it's exactly the same thing as like with some uh, algorithms. Some of them are pretty straightforward to parallelize on the GPU because the way you do it, you know, on, on a CPU, let's say you've got 20 cores, right? Or maybe you've got 16 cores. On a GPU, I might have 4,000 or 5,000 CUDA cores, right? So the way I parallelize things on a GPU is sometimes inherently a little different than the way I would do it on a CPU. And strings are one of the things that kind of push that to the limit. Hmm. This is um, well, so definitely so it definitely is harder to than parallelizing your typical floating point arithmetic that you would do in a typical gaming application. It is harder to par it's harder to parallelize than like oh look I want this scene lit differently right which is a gaming application. It's it's required a lot of lot of creative thoughts by we have a lot of um, CUDA ninjas we call them dev tech. Uh, and they're mm. very good at CUDA. They're very good at GPU parallelization. Uh, and so they've, they've really kind of optimized a lot of it. Um, this, is, this is, I just want to point this out. This is just the furball uh, that, we, that we just graphed, right? Um, this is uh, 754,000 edges. Um, I mean, you can argue that it kind of breaks down even before then. But you can do things like this is all running on, the, on a single GPU. Um, but you can start to like look at time, so I can kind of scrub through time, um, and then you can add these. Uh, you can add these histograms. So I only want the really high CPR ones, or I only want kind of certain ones. I, I don't have the bin set correctly, but you can kind of. Do all of this that you want, right? In real time. You can and then we're we're pushing up on the limits of WebGL and what my browser can handle. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, yes. Anyway, um I, I did want to to bring that up just because it, it uh kind of helps a little bit. Let me um Rapid, uh, this is the GitHub page, uh, Rapid's AI, or you can go to the actual web page, rapids.ai. Um, getting started, pretty easy. Um, here's all the instructions about how to try and collect in Google Colab. Um, all you really need is a modern GPU, NVIDIA Pascal or better. Um, and then if you, if you really want to get fancy, you can kind of, you know, select what you want. It'll give you the Conda recipes uh, for doing it. You can get it in Conda, you can get it on Docker. In uh, in the GitHub and this so and does Docker create any sort of uh, per major performance overhead, or does it still sort of ship everything out to the GPU so the GPU runs as if you were run as if Docker didn't exist? Yeah, it runs as if bare metal. Uh, so to to get it, you will need something called NVIDIA Docker, uh, which you can install. Um, it's just a a kind of add on to Docker, and all it does is it lets your containers view. Uh, your GPUs on your and have direct access to your bare metal GPUs. Got yeah. it. 
Um, I did just want to point out that all of those notebooks that I showed, including the one, uh, the, the cyber one, so including uh, this one, are all on the notebooks contrib uh, directory right now or repo. Um, they're, they're in various places. So the cyber ones are typically in conference notebooks. Um, that one's mm -hmm. at KDD 2019. Uh, so there's, there's, there's not just that one. Um, there's one that we did with Microsoft. There's one with the plastic data set. Um, all kind of in there. And then there's other ones in our blog notebooks, right? If you go to blog, cyber, our network mapping, flow classification, uh, workbooks are there. Got it. Got it. Um, last bit, I think, and then we might be out of time. Um, people, yeah. ask, people ask how to get started, just real quick. Um, we have pretty nice read the docs, right? I think they're pretty easy to follow. Um, you can get the software uh, in uh, Con install. You can get the Docker container. You can get it from our cloud. So you can get it from in NVIDIA GPU cloud. It's there as well. And then always are interested in people uh, joining us, right? So you can feel free to, to join any of these. Um, all of these contribute feedback, uh, documentation support, new issues. Uh, we welcome all of it. Cool. Cool. I don't know if you had any oh, other questions. Right. Happy, to, happy to answer so any. Anyone have any other questions? Do we have any questions, Sarah? I will take that as a no then. Well, thank you so much, Bartley. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. I know that for many data scientists, uh, waiting for your Hadoop job or Spark job or whatever long, uh, a pandas job is a major pain point of the job and being able to accelerate that is something that is certainly very exciting to me and I think very exciting for many of the folks in our audience. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this latest. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just want to say, yeah, certainly. And, and like I said, we, we really mean it with, uh, with GitHub and GitHub issues. Uh, we really want people to use it, kick the tires. That's why we put it out early. Um, we put it out before it's finished, uh, and so we're, we're really excited with any feedback, and thanks again for having me. Absolutely, and I hope uh, the audience has enjoyed this as well. If you're interested in hearing more about our free data science fellowship for PhDs or master's students, or our corporate training, or our online courses, you can learn more at thedataincubator.com. Thank you so much, Bartley. Thanks, Michael.